Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Today is a difficult day for everybody. Difficult day for Lorna and the family. Difficult day for us all as we gather here this day to give thanks for and to celebrate the life of John Henry Nelson Ferris Harry, as we all knew him. We gather here in church in God's presence, asking God for his comforts, his strength, and his understanding. I'm sure today and the days that lie ahead, you will join with me in praying for Lorna and the family. On behalf of Lorna, Joan, Susie, and David, thank you so much, everyone, for either being here or for logging in online and watching this service wherever you are. It means so much to them to be surrounded by family and friends and colleagues on such a difficult day. A number of folks can't be here. Apologies for those who can't physically get into our building today due to social distancing, but you're able to join us through the medium of social media. David, Harry's youngest son, David, we are so sorry that you are unable to be here in person with us today. And may I just say that you, David, are very much in our thoughts and prayers this day. We realize the difficulty that this causes you and the, the hurt and the angst. But we are delighted, David, that later on you will join us on the screen as your video will be played as you and John lead the eulogy to your father. Lorna, John, Susie, David, on behalf of your family here in Strain, on behalf of the session, may I express to you our sincere I know it has been an easy week. It's been a challenging week all round, and it will continue to be difficult but we do hold you in our thoughts and in our prayers. I know that we're not meant to, but I know there's been plenty of hugs, and you know that we will continue to hold you close, and that your heavenly Father will hold you close today and in the days that lie ahead. Our hearts go out to you. You know, folks, we call this a service of thanksgiving. It's still difficult. It's still hard. We still look for meaning in life and what has happened. You know, we turn to the words that like Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And we look at other words in the Bible as well. From 1 Corinthians, it says this, things beyond seeing, things beyond our hearing, things beyond our imagination have all been prepared by God for those who love him. Harry was so much loved by God, so much loved by us all. He's in a far better place right now. So we gather to worship God together this day. Music is so important to Lorna, so important to Harry and his family. Um, something will be said about one of the other hymns shortly. But I'm going to invite you to stand together. Uh, if you don't have a face mask on, if you can wear one, I would ask you to put it on for the singing. And stand as we sing together, as we worship God, as we sing the words of our opening hymn, Now thank we all our God. Let's worship God.
Please be seated. Let us bow our heads and come into God's presence as we talk to him in prayer. Let us pray. Our dear Father, we draw aside from the busyness of life to acknowledge who you are. You are God, the one who designed and created our universe, the one who made us, the one who loves us without measure and who understands us perfectly. Father, it was you who said that for us there would be a time to be born and a time to die. Because of that, you know how we are all feeling this day. Lord, as we celebrate Harry's life, as we thank you for all the earthly time that we have shared, we ask, Father, please bring your peace, comfort, and understanding of what lies beyond this earth. Draw close to us now, we pray. Fill this building with your Holy Spirit and help us as we worship you. Come, Father, we pray. In your son's precious name. Amen. I'm going to ask Harry's daughter Susie to come forward to read to us from God's word. And that's going to be followed by the Reverend William Sinclair, um, previous minister here of Strain and a good family friend who's also going to read. So Susie. James chapter 2 verses 14 to 18. What good is it, my brothers and sister, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm, well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have faith. Show me your faith without deeds. And I will show you my faith by my deeds. Amen. Lorna, John, Susie and David and the family. Um, It's with sadness that I'm here today because this building has so many memories uh, with, associated with Harry. But Alison, Laura, Jill, that send their love and prayers to you today as we join with you. Uh, I was thinking the first time that I uh, preached in this church was when the church was vacant. Um, I was quite nervous, and Harry spotted it and said at the end of the service, I could have given you something to calm your nerves. And then the other, uh, as I stand here uh, this this afternoon, the other uh, memory that's so vivid was, uh, that sums up Harry as well, was just about a a week before Susie's wedding here in November 1998, um, Harry had to have bypass surgery. And I remember visiting him in uh, the, the Royal and he was still in the high dependency unit and all sorts of um, contraptions attached to him. And I can still see him uh, try to sit up in the bed and say, William, I will be at the wedding. The wedding was only the next Saturday and this was Sunday. And I remember saying to him, Harry, I know you will. Because I knew he was a determined, he would say, a stubborn county or man, man but he was determined and he did make it. And as we remember it so, so plainly, uh, during the first hymn, Harry 
wanted his daughter, he wanted to do that. He walked Susie up the aisle, stood beside her all the way through the first hymn. I went up and whispered to him, Harry, there's a seat there, you can sit. I'm standing. And uh, he stood the whole way through. At the end of the service, about three people came to me and said, you were very cruel making Dr. Ferris stand just a week after his heart surgery. We joked about that many times uh, later. Uh, Harry uh, was such a generous, generous in his career and uh, in his work, generous with his friends, generous with his church, generous with all he met. On my first Sunday here, he presented me with a communion box that, that uh, had um, a cup and a, a, a plate, and he said, I'm keeping this for a special occasion. And he said, I think it's arrived. And that was such an encouragement. And I've always kept that and remembered that. He was generous in his giving. He was a man who gave and gave and gave. Uh, and that uh, reading that Susie um, uh, read there, Harry's faith worked out in his actions. His actions uh, were an outworking of his faith. He was also gifted. Uh, everything he turned his hand to, he did well, whether it was yachting or golfing or craft, whatever he did uh, in his career and in his work as well. He was a gifted man, and he did everything so well. And he was gracious. He had a quiet, softly spoken voice, but there is a steely determination behind that as well. He was firm. Uh, he was friendly and he was fair, but he was also firm. Uh, and uh, in session meetings, uh, Harry would uh, remain quiet, would listen, would take everything on board, and then in his quiet, gentle way, but wonderful way, his words. And his words had weight. He knew he had thought them through generous, gifted, and gracious. Uh, and I know you're going to miss a dad, a husband, and a granddad who was so good to you. And uh, you are very much in our family's prayers at this time, as I know you will be in this, the fa the, this church family's prayers too. I, I've been asked to read to you from John chapter 14. The disciples and Jesus are, um, they've been in the upper room and Jesus is about to go the way of the cross. He's about to suffer on the cross. He's told his disciples that he's going to leave them. They're disturbed and they're troubled. And in a sense, Jesus is the one who probably needs to be comforted, but he comforts them. And he says these words. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where we are going, so we know the way. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Verse 27, he says these words. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Thank you, Susie, for reading. Thank you for reading and for those very personal words as well. How would you sum up Dr. Harry Ferris? Thankfully, I don't have to. Thankfully, that task falls to John and David. But let me say what I can, and let me bring you some words of understanding and hopefully comfort. Harry, as I'm sure so many of you knew him in different capacities, as a father, as a husband, as a grandfather, papa, as a friend who was always there, 
as a colleague who you aspired to be maybe, who kept you right, his high standards always portrayed in a lovely way. As a golfer, stage when the inside was a lovely pink colour, to leading our strain golf days and seeing Harry in a completely different light with a wee twinkle in his eye when he was in the clubhouse and just enjoying the company and the, and the fellowship of others and, and working the tables and chatting to being an elder here in church retiring as such to become elder emeritus but I'm sure a lot of you would realise that Harry never really retired he kept on working away in the background you see Harry was very much a man who as those verses that said that were so relevant to him. Let me read to you the last part of that reading. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. We live in a country, don't we, that so many people stand on street corners at times and shout, and they talk very vocally about and yet we don't see that. Harry was the opposite. Harry's actions spoke volumes. If you needed a helping hand, Harry was there. If you needed encouragement, he was there. I still remember I first dipped my toe into strain in 2012 as a summer assistant. And I was only here a couple of days by myself with Barbara in the office. And this gentleman appeared at the office door, very apologetic, saying, I am really sorry, but I'm about to head up the North Coast You'll not see me till the end of summer, but I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Harry Ferris. That summed Harry up. He was always there for people because he always let his actions speak. Why? Why was he that nature? Why was he so gentle? Why was he just such that loving man? Because he had the love of God in his heart. And he wanted to share that with others in his own way. He didn't ram it down your throat. He didn't force you to sit and listen to him. But his actions caused you to stop and to watch. Such a man whose actions spoke volumes. That's his lasting legacy. I mean, you talk to anybody in this church family... And they will all have a story about Dr. Ferris, about what he did for them, how he even just spoke to them. I, I can see you, Lorna, and, and Harry sitting across in, that, in your pew, just to your side, and always a smiling face, always welcoming, always the last two out of the building because you were standing chatting. Maybe that's who you take it after, Susie. But just that loving nature because of God in his heart. Harry wanted people to know about his God and he wanted to do it in his way and that's exactly what he did. He always helped. He talked at different times as, as, we, as he shared different stories. He talked about difficult times in his professional life. He talked about the times whenever he said to his staff around him, the angels were flying low today. He said about the times whenever his hand was guided by someone else. He knew that God was with him. Which is why today we know where Harry is. Yes, this is a hard day. And there's plenty of tears. And there has been tears. And there's going to be more tears. And there's going to be tears of the good memories. There's also going to be the tears of missing Harry. Missing Papa. He's in a far better place. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And when it's ready, I will come and take you to be where I am. What William read to us, Jesus speaking. On this week, Harry's heavenly home was ready. And at the precise moment that God ordains, Jesus came and took him by the hand and took him to his heavenly home. To a place where now Harry doesn't know any ailment, doesn't have any sadness, 
no tears, no sorrow, to a place where he is praising God, where the voice is back and he's singing at the top of his voice, praising and worshipping his heavenly Father. Jesus knew for his disciples that would be a hard journey for them to watch. And for us it's a hard journey to watch. That's why that verse comes in at the end. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled or be afraid. Harry understood perfectly how this life is only the start. This life is the doorway to eternity with God. This is the first step along that path. And whenever that time comes that God has ordained for our life to end here, when we love him, when we trust him, he welcomes us with open arms. He has welcomed Harry to his home, to his personal house, which has got ready for him. And that's where he is now. That's why this is a service of thanksgiving, a service of praise, a service of worship, because we know, we are assured of where he is this day. And we give thanks to God for that. But this is still a difficult day. A day full of challenges and heartache and time that lies ahead, which will be the same. So later on, as you leave this place, please remember those words taken from James of how the writer talks about letting your actions speak for you. And may that remind you of Harry. As you think of the things that he did, as you think of maybe how he taught you, showed you, how he befriended you, how he walked around the golf course with you, helping you to, to correct your swing or your putt, as he sat and chatted to you in the clubhouse, as he just was your friend. Think about those actions, what motivated those actions. And then as you, maybe your heart is heavy, have the peace of knowing where Harry is this day that he is with his father and now he is in glory. I would ask us to pause and going to lead us again in prayer. And at the end of that prayer, I'm going to ask you if you wish to join in for us all to pray together in a prayer which Harry said many a times, the Lord's Prayer, a prayer full of meaning, a prayer which is special, and just to contemplate upon that. But let us bow our heads and let us pray together. Lord, we come into your presence once again. Lord, we come in knowing that you understand how we feel this day. Your own son cried tears of sorrow whenever his friend died. So you understand our pain this day. You understand that those who have loved Harry the most will miss him the most and their hearts will break the most. So, Father, we want to pray for your arms of peace and comfort to be around those who will miss most. For Lorna. Lord, it has been a lifetime together. Just may Lorna feel herself carried by you. And in those days when it's too much for her, just let her fall into your arms for your comfort. For John and Susie and David, Lord, again, as they miss their father, that they would just know that he is with you, that they would have those good memories. And for the rest of their blessed family, for, for Alison, for Scott, for Cheryl, for Harry, for and Edward, for Anna, for Holly and Mark, for Callum and Kesiah, as they miss Papa, Father, just help them to give it over to you. And may they realize where Papa is now. And may that bring peace and comfort to them. Lord, as a, as a church family, we will miss Harry. We will miss seeing him. We will miss hearing him. We will miss the, the, the impact that he has had on this fellowship here. But Lord, we want to thank you for him. Thank you for how you have blessed us with all that he has done, realizing, Lord, that there is a lasting legacy there, a legacy which points towards you, 
and helps us to see your love for us. So, Father, we thank you. Lord, we join together now as we say the words that your Son taught us, as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As I said earlier, music and hymns are so important in the Ferris households. The next hymn that we are about to sing is a, a particularly special piece. It's a prayer. It says, make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is injury, your pardon, Lord. Where there's doubt, true faith in you. It's about God using our actions to bring peace. The way Harry used his actions to bring peace and understanding. These are lovely words. These are words that were sung at Susie and John's weddings. So it's lovely for us to be able to sing this piece here today. So I would ask you please to stand and to sing these words together. Make me a channel of your peace. be seated. John, I'm going to ask you to come to the front to bring the eulogy to your father, and I'm going to slip over to the side, and by technology, we'll bring David onto the screen. See if the face ID works without my mask on. John Henry Nelson Ferris. Harry, Dad, Papa, Uncle Harry, Skipper. We're here to celebrate his life. And David and I thought we would share with you some reflections of Dad's life at work, at leisure, and at home. So what defined Dad? First and foremost, he was a doctor. 
He was the delivery man of the art connection. So Dad in lower sixth thought, do you know what, I'll have another great year at Royal School Dundan, playing rugby and out with my mates. His father had other ideas. He said, young man, you're going to do your Latin exams, you're going to Trinity, and you're not going to do your final year at school. So off he was packed to Trinity as a fellow 17-year-old and had five years, as Buster will know, of a great time playing rugby, playing golf. And then he had to do a bit of work in the final year to qualify. He had a brief dalliance with orthopedic surgery, but he really knew his vocation was obstetrics. It was never a job to dad. It was his life. And uh, the first mentor he had was we, George Gibson in Lurgan, who taught him uh, the art of obstetrics, something he continued to preach for the rest of his professional career. He then arrived as a consultant in arts and was uh, supported by Freddie Grant and then by Mike Park as his consultant colleagues. He was fortunate across the province to have great colleagues, Buster and Yuri, uh, Graham Harley, who had a lifelong professional and personal friendship with. But Dad would be the first person to tell you that the most important aspect of his work was the team that he worked with. He may have been the consultant, but just as important were the nurses, and the midwives, the cleaners, the catering staff, everybody. And I remember him telling me a story that when one of his registrars just down from the city hospital, you know, a bit full of himself, very nice to Dad, and he said, young man, before I write you a reference, I'd just like you to write on how you deal with the other members of this team. Because it's been fed back to me that you're perhaps a little bit above your station when it comes to dealing with the other members of this team. That doesn't work with me. So the young man changed his ways. So Christmas days here in Strain Church were closely followed by a dash around the ward. Mum looking at her watch, going, it's turkey. So we went around theatres, the gynae wards, the dare house, meeting everybody. And even at that, looking back, you realised how important the team was to Dad. So one and two rota. Imagine junior doctors now thinking of that. One and two rota, no registrar. 300 deliveries a year, he did personally. So by my calculation, there's probably about 10,000 babies he delivered. Most seemed to come between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Isn't that right, Buster? The obstetricians in the corner will be nodding there. Um, but he didn't seem to need much, much sleep. Didn't seem to need much sleep. So nothing pleased Dad more than teaching the art of obstetrics to his trainees. I'm so glad to see his colleagues here today. How to use those Keelan's forceps safely. A man with a cesarean section rate of less than 5%. Um, and that was his vocation. And he loved seeing these young men and women going out and becoming consultants, going around the world. I know Hugh Skelly, Hugh, you're probably listening in Brisbane. Uh, Trevor and others, you know. That was, gave him a huge, huge pleasure as a teacher. So when I talked about the team, I have left out three of the most important people in Dad's professional life. Three women who achieved what my mother failed to do in 57 years. Organize Harry Paris. Anne Cowie, and I know you're listening in Scotland, who looked after him in his NHS work. Maureen McClements, and then latterly, Kim Kirk. Susie, David, and I have memories of the nervous women who would come into Danecroft, 13 Belfast Road, traipsed up the stairs. The more overweight they were, the more nervous they looked because they knew they were going to be greeted at the top of the stairs by Kim and the scales that never lied. It was bad cop, good cop. Kim would give them a sort of a chastening word about their, their weight and then and see the good cop in his big leather chair. When you're the son or daughter of Harry Ferris, no matter where you are in the world, you'll meet somebody and they go, oh, Susie Ferris, John Ferris, is your, yeah, he is, gosh, yeah, yeah, he delivered me, oh, really, interesting. And just a couple of anecdotes, 
So when Dad passed away on Monday, the ambulance man who attended to him was delivered by Dad. The undertaker, whose birthday it was on Monday, was delivered by Dad. The lady I spoke to at the crematorium to organize his death certificate was delivered by Dad. And when he was having his minor tussle with COVID a couple of months ago, the radiologist came up to him to discuss his chest x-ray. I thought it was a bit unusual, a radiologist coming to talk about a chest x-ray. He said, Dr. Ferris, I just want to come and shake your hand because my mum said you were the one that saved my life the day I was born. But actually, my favorite story of that ilk was when mum was having a little skin cancer removed by Mr. Lewis uh, a couple of years ago. And she was talking about, obviously, medical language. I said, Mrs. Ferris, are you medical? She goes, yes, I was a, a doctor. And was your husband medical? And she goes, yes. She said, let me guess. My husband delivered you. He said, more than that, Mrs. Ferris. I'm named after your husband. Harry Lewis was one of three brothers, and the third brother, his mother said, we'll call you Harry after my dad. So dad was a skilled surgeon. People who worked with him, he had these, these tiny little hands, size six and a half gloves. He had this natural manual dexterity. He must have been a joy to teach when, if he was with Free George. He made simple things look easy. He had a natural respect for the tissues and the flow of an operation. And Jeff, you kind of just to quote one of my lines there, which was I was chatting to dad a couple of years ago about surgery and things weren't going well. And he said exactly that. When he and Frank, the irascible Frank Connolly at the top end in anesthetizing, when the angels were flying low, he just felt that there was a higher power above him guiding his hands and getting them through things. But you can be technically brilliant, you can be clinically sound, but what makes you loved by your patients? And Buster, you summed it up on Tuesday when you were chatting to me. It was his kindness his empathy, and his innate ability to communicate empathetically with his patients and their relatives. Didn't matter what strata of society you were from, didn't matter if you're rich or poor, dad treated everyone the same. And that's in all walks of his life. Um, and there's a nice story, which I'll try and tell. It's an award round with dad, was a medical student. And we've been around the guy in the award round, and he was saying to the medical students from Queen's, what's the most important thing you learnt today on the ward round? And they said, oh, such and such about hysterectomy, such and such, all these gyny things. He said, well, those were all important, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing was I spoke to every patient on that ward. There may be Dr. Park's patient or my patients, but there's somebody's mother, grandmother or daughter, and I spoke to every one of them. That sums up that. Leisure. As an obstetrician of one and two rotor, there wasn't much, much time for leisure, but golf was a lifelong passion. I think he first picked up a club at the age of eight, and John McLean is here today, was probably one of the first people he was hacking the ball uh, around with. He absolutely loved his golf. He played for Trinity, and then afterwards, many have remembered. Don Patterson, who sadly passed away recently, Don, one of Ireland's premier golf teachers, the pro, he played the pro-ams. He remember talking about a week they spent playing at Portrush. He said, John, the biggest club I hit at Calamity all week was a five iron. He hit the long ball. He loved his uh, time playing with Irene and Buster when Irene was training for the, uh, the Irish golf team. He loved his time in Portrush playing with uh, Uncle Ian, my grandfather, my papa. And Dad said he was often the peacekeeper amongst the two as my papa would be winding up his son around the links. He probably, in his recent years, well, 10 years ago, his best memories for golf were with Bill, his beloved Bill and Elaine Stewart. It's lovely to see you here today. Bill lying his trips to Donegal, and Mark, I'll never forget his face, in his 70th when we surprised him at Karen's house up at Muirfield, thinking he and Bill were going to play Muirfield the next day, but it actually was a four ball. And it was a couple of months before the Open, the stands were up, and that will always stick in my memory. It's a great golfing memory. Dad was a golf pro's dream. It was physically impossible for him to walk into a golf shop of any description 
without buying something. Be it a putter, be it a jumper, a driver, maybe these shafts need changing. Our house is like an Aladdin's cave that would make American golf look like it's understocked. Uh, when it comes to uh, his clubs, he was a member of Royal Portrush since 1963. More recently, he was a member of Port Stewart, and he absolutely loved the club and the people up there. But of course, his spiritual home was, and will always be, Kirkston. He loved Kirkston. And it's great to see so many members of Kirkston here today. He was very proud to be their president in 2007, 2008. And it's fitting for, for Dad that his legacy of his presidency was a fantastically crafted outdoor toilets on the course, beautifully covered in turf. Even as the golfer, Harry Ferris was thinking of the needs of the ladies of the Arts Committee. But he loved the juniors, and when he heard that the junior golf team didn't have their, their blazer, didn't have their jerseys and things like that, he made sure that they were well kitted out. So every night, Dad would walk his beloved paddock up around Blackwood. Now, I think Blackwood must have the most wayward members when it comes to hitting golf balls in the world. Either that or Paddy is just a genius, because when he was going around, he would pick up between 10 or 25 balls a night, mainly because he got a little titbit for every ball that he got. He had to ration them to half a titbit because he got so many balls. So our garage is full of buckets of balls, which he would take down and leave at Kirkuston, so the juniors always had the golf balls. They also came in handy when our lot came back for their annual thing of new sports jerk and tried to take on the valley, or heaven forbid, Dunluce. We could hardly carry our bags onto the tee because they were so laden with uh, golf balls. Um, and I say Paddy was a constant companion with Bill and Dad in, in Donegal. The one thing that Kirkson might not thank Dad for was the small part he played in Neil Graham and uh, Glavin's move up to the north coast. And, uh, he recognized, chaps, your talent, and if he helped in any small way in your move and see you happy in your new jobs, that meant a lot to him. Teaching, he loved teaching obstetrics. There's nothing he loved more than teaching with golf. Uh, he's taught all six of the grandchildren here today how to play, and even if Holly knows him as the intimidator, uh, he didn't try to be. He would love just that little subtle change in your grip or your stance, uh, and you don't think that's not going to make a difference. And to see the look in his face, the golf ball started going down the range, straight and true. But how does a man of 89 get to still be on a golf course? Well, that's thanks to Dr. Lee, who's here today, Dad's acupuncturist, who before his spinal surgery kept him on the move. And then Ali Lyons, his Pilates teacher. I didn't know that 80 plus people went to Pilates, and I'd love to have a chat with Alison just to say what exactly did Dad do in these Pilates classes. But she kept his mobility going so he could enjoy the most enjoyable day of his week, which is playing with Seamus, Kieran, and Eamon on the four ball, the Fitzgerald Ferris four ball at Kirkston. Now, he may have needed injections and steroids in his knees recently, and thanks, chaps, for picking the ball out of the hole and teeing it up for him when he couldn't bend down to do it until he had the steroid injection. Um, but he loved spending time with you. He loved the crack, that fierce competition for the one-pound wager that at the end of the round was put in a pot to go together for the Christmas drink. He loved your companionship, and I know that that little hip flask with his medicinal elixir has now been transferred to your safekeeping, and he'd be delighted to know that that is protecting you against the bitter wind off the Irish Sea for many rounds to come. The problem with the golf course, of course, is that people can get hold of you. Even the days before mobile phones, he was never really away. So sailing was Dad's other real love and his passion. Um, it's the only time he could really let his hair down and be away from work. Dickie and Deirdre, going was lovely to see you here today. I remember him coming back, you know, from your trips down to Portugal and others when you were teaching him how to be a sailor. But it wasn't just the sailing. In fact, I don't think it even was the sailing. It was just the boat and being away on the boat. But even in the winter, Dad would love pottering. His Nicholson 35 star dancer was the best kitted out Nick, I think, there's ever been. 
and he would take pieces of wood and he'd shape them and he'd put the compass in there or the binoculars uh, and those woodworking skills uh, were honed later life with Tony Kent, his mentor and wood shaping uh, ex uh, expert and dear friend. But actually probably pride of place and star dancer was the bespoke drinks cabinet, which that bottle of Bell's Alfie and the Gordon's gin were so snugly secured that even the stormiest sea in the Bay of Biscay, they were not budging one millimeter. So what about the crew? Pretty motley bunch. Alfie Wright, Tom McCullough, Stuart Ritchie. Bill, well, Bill was the cook and chief washer up, but don't ask Bill to navigate. Then the youngsters, myself, Bob Stinson, Tony Hannon, David, and of course, Mark. So when Mark had been living with us for a year, uh, just polishing off his A-levels, it was always Uncle Harry, and I think what sums up the difference between dad on land and dad at sea uh, was when Mark arrived at Donica D, first trip, all the bags, hops on board, said, Uncle Harry, lovely to see you. And he said, Mark, just give me a second. He said, is Uncle Harry there? But it's either Harry or Skipper here. Uh, and that sort of summed up the change. So were women allowed on, on board? Were there any female crew? Beloved Susie was only allowed to join the crew of Star Dancer when she'd had a gap year uh, and came back. And she was joined by Kerry. And although I c you'll find out in a minute why I can't tell too many folk tales, Susie, as you all know, is completely devoted to her dad. Uh, but her devotion uh, shows no bounds when you hear this story. So off Kinsale, calm day, motoring along, engine stops. Why? Fishing line around the propeller. All the men on board think, what are we going to do? I know, somebody needs to dive overboard with a kitchen knife and cut the rope off the propeller. Any volunteers? All eyes on Susie. Rope round her ankle, mask on, Holly you've been proud of her, kitchen knife in hand, over the board, bobbing up and down, underneath Star Dancer, up for breath, away at these things. Um, so that's what the only story I can tell. Why? Because there was a code in Star Dance so that if you got north of Carlingford Lock or if you were south of the Mulligan Tire, you weren't allowed to say anything. I can say three things though. G and T at Nooners, mainly G and not much T. When Skipper said, we're going to go for a short walk, you were in trouble. And Bob's job was really to find a table in the hostelry that had a nice big rubber plant close by. Those who will know will know why. And you knew if you're flagging towards the end of the night and you asked Skipper, Skipper, when are we going home? Are we going home? He would turn around with his Cheshire cat grin. And the stock answer was, quarter past. So I'm just going to pass over to David now, who's going to talk about life of dad and the family. Greetings from Australia, or should I say, g'day. Gerald Callum and I are so sad to not be with you all today. We really want to be there in person to celebrate dad and share all of our beautiful memories with family. But dad, first and foremost, was a family man. Family was the most precious thing to him. Dad met mum at a party and their friend, Dr. Big and fast mover that he was, more or less so. They were married four years later, on the 2nd of April, 1964, and so enjoyed a full 61 years together. Dad could not have led the life that he did without mum's constant love and support. A lot of an obstetrician's wife is not an easy one. Like many Ulstermen, Dad was not a demonstrative man, nor was he prone to public displays of affection, but he loved mum dearly. I would say Dad's love language was gift giving. As all of us in the family and many outside would agree, seeing others happy made him happy. It's not to say that living with Dad was not without its frustrations. Dad had two speeds, go slow or stop. Whether it was driving his car, which was usually at 50 miles per hour if Mum was in a rush to get somewhere, or getting ready to go out, or even if it was an emergency 
soon as I'm off school, he rarely goes into a shop. For him, no one's steady, only is. Dad loved pottering in the garden or in his workshop, which was fine by mum, but he did have a habit of while still wearing his best silver shoes. He was always ordering gadgets and catalogs, usually one a week. And the only thing they all had in common was that he rarely knew how to use them. And so they all ended up around his door to ride him out. Timekeeping. Dad was a great man for his electricity messages, especially at Christmas time, when every Christmas Eve he would always be driving around the countryside delivering presents and gifts to those who needed them most. Dad was, as you all know, one of the most generous men you were ever likely to meet. And so many messages we received over the last few days have spoken about his many acts of generosity and thoughtfulness. Dad was also a man of few words. His words were not always required. His dog Susie and I always knew what he was proud of, and he only had to be stubborn when he wasn't. He was always happy to offer advice even when I didn't think I needed it. And although I might not always have listened at the time, he was generally right. And I now have a wealth of his way. And he quietly reveled in the sporting, academic, and business achievements. He had the joy of spending many summers with him in Fort Stewart, on the golf course, or evenings in the Harbour Bar giving some time. Dad loved his family party. And even though because of geography, it was rare that all of us ones that stand out to me are their 50th wedding anniversary, where we all gathered at the Valley Liquor Store with them. And at, after dinner, Dad and Mum cut some checks across the dining table, and he indicated he still had a need. But the one I will treasure the most is Cheryl's and my wedding in Spain in October 2019, which unfortunately, thanks to COVID, was the last time that I saw Dad and the memory of him the assembled Irish and Kenyan clans singing Ireland's Call. Dad said it was the best wedding he'd ever been to, but Susie didn't know that was soon. The time Cal and Cheryl and I got to spend with him and Mum was a very precious place. So Harry, Dad, Papa, Skipper, we will all miss you terribly. truly blessed to have you in our lives for so long and we will continue to make you proud as you watch over us. We love you so much. Rest easy, Dad. And we'll see you again at quarter past. Thank you. John and David for so personal words. Susie, say favourite wedding. Got it in there. Thank you one and all for joining with the family here today to give thanks for Harry's life. As I said earlier, I'd ask you please to continue to remember them in your prayers in the days that lie ahead. These will continue to be hard times for them. So let's surround them with our love and with our prayers. In a moment, we're going to stand to sing our closing hymn, beautiful words which start off, The day thou givest, Lord, is ended. At the end of this hymn, I would ask you please to remain standing as I pronounce the benediction. And then the family and I will, will process down the church and out through these doors. If I could ask you all just to please stand fast while we do so. Um, and then once the family have left, folks down this side of the church, if you'll go out through these side doors, this side door here, Balcony, if you can hang on just till we get the family out and settled. And for the folks down this side, if you can just wait until one of our stewards gives you a nod to come out the door behind me. And then we'll all meet again out in front of church. But let us stand. Let us sing these lovely words which you chose, Lorna. The day thou gavest, Lord, is ended.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our heavenly Father, and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore and until we meet again. Amen.